You probably know the story of the blind men and the elephant. The king gets one of his ministers to gather up the blind people in the city and then says, okay, show them an elephant. And so some of the blind people touch the elephant's legs, some touch his trunk, some touch his tusks, some touch his body, some touch his, his tail. And depending on what they touched, they have their ideas about what an elephant is or what it's like. Some say the elephant's like a post, and the elephant's like a greenery, like the pole of a plow. My favorite one is the ones who touch the tail, so an elephant's like a broom. And then the blind people start fighting each other over the, the way to interpret the elephant, saying it's like this, it's not like that. The creepy part of the story, of course, is that the king did this for his entertainment, and he's gratified by the sight of the blind people fighting. But what's even creepier, though, is that there's another version of the story. It comes in the Chinese canon. It's the same story, but it's interpreted differently. In the Pali canon, the blind people are non-Buddhist sectarians. They don't know the Dharma, and they fight over the Dharma because they don't really know it. In the Chinese story, the blind people stand for all people, Buddhist or not, basically saying that even Buddhists are blind. There's nobody who can really know the Dharma. All we know is winnowing baskets and brooms, granaries, posts. We don't really know the elephant, and then it's impossible for us to know the elephant. So we, we shouldn't fight over our interpretations. Just content ourselves that some people see the ear of the elephant and so they think it's a winnowing basket. Well, they have to content themselves with the winnowing basket, and you have to content yourself with your broom or your granary or whatever. And that story is not just in the Chinese canon, it's still told to this day in all kinds of Buddhist centers. It's a really destructive version of the story, because the implication is that nobody can ever know the Dharma. It's too big. And the other implication, of course, is that well, you might as well stop trying to figure out what way of knowing the Dharma is right or not. Now, it is true that there's an awful lot in the Buddha's awakening. As he said, it's like a forest full of leaves, and what he taught was just a handful of leaves. But it is a handful, and the handful is what's important to know. That's all we really have to know. And it's something we can get our heads around. It's the Four Noble Truths. That's not all that much to comprehend. To paraphrase John Lee, there are people out there who can manage orchards of thousands of acres. And here we have just four noble truths, or four jhanas, and we can't get them straight. It's kind of embarrassing. The implication being, of course, it's not all that much that we have to master. And it's something we can master. And we're not going to spend our lives always being blind. After all, the Buddha was one with eyes, and one of his images for the path, or his act of teaching, is that he's a doctor who can cure people of their blindness. You probably know that story as well. There's a blind man, and someone gives him a cloth. It's a dirty old rag, but the person who gives him the cloth says, here's a nice white piece of cloth that looks really nice on you. So the blind man takes good care of the, the dirty old rag, thinking it's a nice white piece of cloth. And then his friends and relatives take him to a doctor who can cure him of his blindness. As he gets his sight back, he looks at the cloth and sees it as a dirty old rag. What he thought was valuable was not. The gaining of sight, of course, is the gaining of the Dharma eye. When you see that there really is something deathless, and it can be attained through the path. So we're here to get over our blindness. And we have to take it as an encouragement that it is possible to get over our blindness. Don't listen to the people who say that you can't. Just this evening there was a magazine that arrived in which someone was writing about how when he started on the Buddhist path he was hoping for enlightenment. 
And what he got instead was awakening to the fact that there really is nothing to know, and you should satisfy yourself with this state of not knowing. That, again, is a destructive way of thinking. There is something to know, and when you know it, it makes a huge difference. On the one hand, it confirms the fact that your actions really do make a difference in your life. You know that if you hadn't acted on the path, you wouldn't have reached the deathless. You wouldn't have seen the deathless. And you also see, in stepping out of space and time, just how long this process of suffering has been. It gives you all the more encouragement to do what you can to get past it, to complete the practice. Even though you realize in, in gaining this vision you've cut off a lot of the suffering that you would have you would have had to have gone through if you hadn't gained this this vision, this sight. But still you see what it's like to be totally free of suffering. And just the act of being in the six senses, being immersed in the world of space and time in the six senses, there's a lot of suffering there. So take heart in the fact that however blind you may feel you are in terms of the path, blindness is something that can't be cured. This is what the Eightfold Path is all about. You develop right view all the way through right concentration. These are qualities that enable you to see more clearly. And here again, think about that interpretation of the, the story of the elephant. If you say that everybody's blind and they have to content themselves with window ba windowing baskets and brooms and whatnot, you're basically saying there is no right or wrong. But right view is right because it works. It really does form a part of the, the path to the deathless that takes you out of your blindness. Right resolve is right because it works, and so on down through the factors of the path. The more mindful you are when you've learned a lesson that helps you to see more clearly, the more concentrated the mind, the more still you are, the more you can see what's going on inside. And even before you hit the deathless, you're able to see parts of your mind that were hidden in blind spots up to that point. So we're here to see and to develop the qualities of mind that enable us to see the right view that has us look at the right spot. The right effort that helps to clear away the things that get in the way of our seeing. And the right concentration that gives us an all-around vision. We get the mind centered. And once it's properly centered, it can look around itself. Because you see not only the object that you're focused on when you concentrate, but you begin to see the activities of the mind as they relate to the object. And that's what you want to see. You want to see what you're doing. This is the big blind spot in our lives, and it's very ironic. I mean, it's right close to us, what we're doing, our intentions for why we're doing things. We should know these clearly, but we have a tendency to hide them from ourselves, or just to get interested in other things so much that we don't see what we're doing. So we're turning the spotlight on the right spot. What are you doing right now? How are you doing it? How skillfully are you doing it? To what extent are you giving rise to stress, pain, dis-ease, or disturbance by what you're doing? Now can you get the mind more still to step back from those activities? See which ones are unskillful, so you can drop them. See which ones are skillful, so you can keep doing them until they've done the work. We keep following this path, and as the Buddha said, eventually it will take us to a, a place that we haven't seen before, to see the unseen. It's unseen not because it's unseeable, simply because we haven't looked. We haven't looked properly. We don't have the right vision yet, the right capacity to see yet. But that's something that can be developed. that someday we really will see the whole elephant. And we can throw away our concepts of winnowing baskets and 
brooms and granaries. Of course, it's not just a matter of seeing. The Buddha also gives us ways of checking our seeing. You know the story, too, of the elephant hunter looking for the elephant in the forest. He sees the tracks of the elephant. But he doesn't immediately jump to the conclusion that this has got to be an elephant. But still, it looks likely, so he follows it. You see scratch marks in the trees. But again, he doesn't jump to the conclusion that this is a bull elephant. He's looking for a bull elephant because he needs one to do some heavy work. When he saw the footprints, he knew that that might be dwarf females with big feet. Or he sees the scratch marks. These might be tall females with tusks. It's only when he actually sees the elephant that he knows he's got the elephant. The footprints and the scratch marks turn, stand for the various stages on the path. The development of concentration, the development of some of the different powers that come from concentration. But it's that vision of the deathless. That's the whole elephant. And it's something human beings can see. I was talking with a scholar one time who was saying he didn't think that any conditioned human being, all he saw human beings were, were conditioned human beings, could see anything unconditioned. But I was thinking, Backwards. The Buddha's approach wasn't to define what a human being is and then from that definition decide what human beings can and can't know. He looked at what human beings can do and what they can know as a result of their, their actions. And it took him to a place where that really was unconditioned. That's when he realized that defining yourself as doing this, that, or the other thing is placing a limitation on yourself. And this ranges it from everything, just the idea that I am innately good or I am innately bad or whatever I am. You might choose. If you're going to choose an I am, just choose an I am that I am capable of finding awakening. That one will get you through. And you know that you have the capability to see the whole elephant when the whole elephant appears. That's the proof that you don't always have to be blind.